Good morning, everybody. So uh, I'm here to share the updates from the Elixir team. I'm Jose Valim, the creator of Elixir, and co-founder and director of research and development at Platform Attack. And today I'm going to talk about Elixir 1.8, Elixir 1.9, and what is next. So a very quick talk. So before I go into the details, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the rules of the game. So how we do versioning in Elixir. So Elixir follows semantic versioning. So the current release, for example, is 1.8.2. We say that 1 is the major bit. So every time we have a breaking change, we have to change that number. And the usual development happens uh, with the 8, which is the minor bit. So every time we, ha we want to do a new release, we increment that 1. So we have 1.7, 1.8, 1.9. And then the two, in, the, in this case, is the patch number. And that's every time we do a bug fix or something like that. So our schedule is that we do a new minor release every six months. So again, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9. And therefore, no breaking changes. And we don't plan to do breaking changes. We also have a bunch of policies in place that I'm not going to talk about. So we have a policy for our language OTP compatibility, a security policy, deprecation policy. So if you go to our documentation and you search for like compatibility or deprecation or something like that, the page is going to show up and you can read more about it. All right. So uh, I want to share just a couple of the most exciting features we have in the releases. So uh, LX01.8, it's out right now. And it came out in January 2019. And Overall, the whole Elixir history, we have more than 800 contributors. So thanks to everybody who contributed. And um, when I started giving talks about Elixir and new versions, I would always include how many packages we have on Hex and uh, how many downloads we have. But today we know that this is not about Elixir anymore. It's about the whole Erlang uh, and Elixir community and ecosystem. So, but here's the data anyway. So we have more than 8,000 packages and we've passed a uh, half billion downloads. Um, soon I'll have to start decrease the font so we can keep all the downloads in there. And that's great. All right. So one of the features that we got in LXC 1.8 is the rivable structs inspection. And I'm going to break it apart exactly what it means and why you should care as a developer. So in Elixir, we have this feature called structs. So for example, here you define a module, and then you define a struct, and then you define fields of this struct, and you can give them the full values. And now you can create those structs, passing some part of those fields. The other fields are going to be, uh, they're going to use the default values. You can pattern match on them. So this is very similar to Erlang records, with the difference that structs in Elixir, they use maps behind the scenes. And Erlang records, they are built on top of tuples. All right. And in Elixir, we also have this thing called inspection. So what is inspection? All of our data, it's in memory. Right? But we as developers, sometimes we want to look at this data. So we want to convert this data in memory to a textual representation that us developers, we can understand. All programming languages do that. And in Elixir, we call this process inspection. So by default, if you have a struct, like the user struct, and you want to get a textual representation out of it, you're going to get the representation here at the bottom. You're going to say, hey, this is a struct, and you have all the fields and all their values. Again, kind of similar to records in Erlang. But this has a very big problem, right? Especially as here in Europe, we know because of legislation like GDPR. And it says that you have to be very careful about user data and the user privacy. So if you have something that is modeling the user or any kind of private information, and every time you want to show something in your log messages, error messages, stack traces, you're just printing all that information, you can accidentally leak user private information. You can send uh, the user email elsewhere, maybe a service that is handling the logs for you, or maybe a network tracking service. So that's not good. Right? So what we want to do is that we want to say, look, when printing the user, okay, I want to show only those fields. And in Elixir, that was always possible, but Elixir 1.8, because this was being frequently requested, we are now providing a default implementation that you can derive from it in any way you want. So you can say, look, I want to inspect this user, but when I do this, I want you to show only the fields ID and name, and then nothing else is going to be shown, and then you're going to sleep happier, making sure that you are respecting the user privacy. Another feature that came in Elixir 1.8 is time zone database support. So since Elixir 1.4, we have four calendar types. And the issue we had at the time is that many database-related libraries, or many date, daytime-related uh, libraries, they were starting to pop up. And they all had their own time representation. 
So we decided to bring to create a shared vocabulary when it comes to data types, calendar data types. Okay, and we created then time, which is hour, minute, seconds, and a couple other things. Then we have date, which is year, uh, month, days, and then we have naive date time and date time. So what is the difference between those two? A naive date time is a date time without time zone information. Because a daytime with all the time zone information, it's not actually guaranteed to exist. So for example, if we get um, 2.30 in, in the morning, in some dates, it doesn't exist in Sweden, right? Because we have the daylight saving time, so we may skip one hour ahead. Or sometimes it may happen twice if we ro roll the clock back. So it's naive because we cannot actually confirm that that thing actually exists. But if you do have the time zone information, you have a date time. So we added those things to Elixir in 1.4, and with time we were improving their APIs, adding more functions, adding more functionality alongside the community, adding other features. And then uh, we were able to really improve time, date time, naive date time, but we couldn't do a lot with date time. Why? Because in order to work with date time, you need to have a time zone database. And maintaining a time zone database is actually kind of tricky because they don't have like a periodic release schedule. Because sometimes a government just says, you know what, tomorrow you're supposed to change the clock, but what if we don't do that? And then they just change the rule. And then everybody goes crazy. They have to release a new version of a database. And companies, they have to upgrade their database. So, and uh, Boyd was just talking about embedded devices that may not care about time zones at all, for example. And then we don't want to include a whole database there. So what we did is that we define a behavior. So we are basically saying, you can bring your own database. And you can do whatever you want with it. And that's it. This feature was implemented by Lau. So uh, he has been for a while. Uh, talking a lot in the Elixir community on how to handle date and time properly. So he implemented this feature, and he also maintains and develops the TZ data package, which implements this time zone database uh, support for you. So he fetches the data from IANA, and then it also provides auto updates. So if somebody says, oh, I'm changing the rules tomorrow, uh, every once or twice per day, you actually check the database, and then if there is an, um, you actually check the, the IANA services, and then if there's a new version, it automatically updates the data for you, so you don't, don't have to care about it. Right, that's 1.8. And there are a bunch of other improvements, uh, enhancements. You can check the change log. I just want to cover the major ones. And let's talk a little bit about 1.9, which is coming out soon. So the major feature in Elixir 1.9, all the Lang developers are actually quite familiar with that. And this is actually the last major feature we had planned in our backlog, is releases. So what is a release? A release is the ability of getting the whole runtime, virtual machine, your application, and your dependencies, and put it in a single directory or a single file that you can just put that into production and run it. OK, so um, we always had releases in the Elixir community through uh, community packages, right? So uh, developers in the community, they would provide their own implementation of releases. But now it's part of core. So in Elixir 1.9, if you want to assemble a release, uh, you can do that in, very, in four, four very simple steps. You can do, uh, you create a new app, and then you go into that app, you build the release, and that's going to create uh, a release in the build directory for you, right, with an executable which is your front end to the release. You can do everything with the release for that executable. So we just call that executable uh, with start, and your system is running as a release. That's all you have to do. So the release executable, uh, it's, again, it's the front end to your system, how you're going to interact with it. And you can do a bunch of things. You can do start, restart, and stop. That is expected. You can also do RPC commands to the node that is running. Um, you can connect with a remote console. You, it supports one-off commands, so sometimes you just want to start a VM to run something really, really fast, and then um, shut it down. We can do that as well. You can install it as a Windows service. You can uh, run it as a Unix daemon uh, with the Erlang heart integrated and so on. So all those things, again, it's just really an interface. All those things, they are provided by Erlang OTP. We are just wrapping it up in a very um, simple interface. And similarly, uh, we are doing uh, those same things with configuration. So if you want to configure a release, we have a file called vmargs where you configured all the parameters of the virtual machine. We have a way to configure our environment. So sometimes you need to uh, set some environment variables, load some information from the system. You can do that so you can script that code if necessary. 
We also can do build time configuration. So when you assemble your release, you already have some configurations that uh, you don't want expect them to change, so they're always there. And then we have this thing called configuration providers, because sometimes when you want to run your code in production, what you have to do is that every time your VM starts, you need to connect to a vault to get the value of the cookie, or you need to connect to a vault to figure out on which port you want the Erlang distribution to run, or any kind of configuration for your application. Or maybe you have to read from a JSON file that the deployment system put there for you. So we provide uh, this uh, system. We actually inherited that from distillery. And uh, so it's basically runtime configuration, but without using hacks like replace OS vars or things like that. And there are a bunch of thank yous that I would like to do throughout this process of adding releases to Elixir. So a uh, huge thank you to the Erlang OTP team, because again, we are just building on everything that is already there in Erlang. A huge thank, thank you to Distillery. So Distillery is today. If you want to do releases today, you don't want to wait for online. Distillery is the package you're going to use. And it was created by Paul. And we got a bunch of ideas from Distillery. So Distillery was the test bed for a bunch of different ideas that made part of our releases. And also, um, the Relax team, uh, they did a bunch of prior art on how to do releases in Erlang and Elixir as a whole, especially Tristan for reviewing the code, reviewing the scripts, making sure everything uh, makes sense. All right, so that's the main thing I wanted to share about 1.9. And then after 1.9, what do we have? Elixir 2.0? No, right? After 1.9, we have 1.10. So it's going to come out eventually. So what is next for us is the following. So for the first time, perhaps the first time in my life, life across every project ever, uh, the backlog is empty. All of the major features we have planned for Elixir, they are now part of the language. But of course, it doesn't mean that you know, we release 1.9 and it's, it's over. Right? We will continue to release um, to ship minor versions every six months with you know, uh, performance improvements. We are going to continue improving the documentation. Sometimes we get a new small function, or, uh, or maybe there is a feature that is important, but it was not planned. Some kind, something unexpected uh, showed up. So we'll continue doing that. Right? But the important message here is that we don't have plans for a major release, right? And the other important message here is that in order to continue having progress, what we are going to do is that we are going to focus on our foundation, which is exactly Erlang OTP. So we'll continue being, so every time there is a new Erlang OTP version, we want to make sure that Elixir is using that version in the best way possible. We will attempt to contribute more and more uh, to Erlang OTP where we can. Right, so, and that's exactly why we can have an empty backlog, right? Because the Erlang OTP team is doing all the work, so we can just uh, can just now help them. And and the other thing, the other message that we want to get from this is that the most exciting developments uh, they will come from the community. This is, has already been happening for a while, like with projects like Phoenix and now Live View, and we just heard about Scenic, Nerves, Membrane. So. The community is, is already the one that's building all those exciting projects and ideas. And now that we are making official that you know uh, the backlog is empty, let's continue to focus on those other areas. We hope that it's going to go even further. So if you want to get involved, um, the best way is to actually get involved with the community and those projects and make sure that those projects continue to grow healthily and so on. All right, that's all I had to share. Uh, thank you. It would be really sweet if we just could produce an ARM binary from an Intel machine? Yeah, so we don't have, so if you go to the documentation, one of the things that we do a lot is, we write a lot of documentation, really a lot, so we talk about this in the release documentation. We don't have cross compilation at the moment, so, uh, but we talk about different, what you can do, so for example, if you're working with containers, you can al always do a container, run a VM, and you can assemble that in ACI, uh, or in your machine, or you know, you, there, so there are, the short answer is we don't do cross compilation. I think it's a much it's a much more complex task which would have to work with their Lingo TP team. So that's potentially a part for uh, collaboration. Uh, so we don't have the, we don't do that now, but there are ways to achieve a similar result. But I I totally agree with you that if we didn't have to do other ways in the first place and just got something that worked across all systems, that would be better. But we don't have it. Please give Yoseo a big hand. <laughs>